Hello, everyone. This is Pato Pais. Today, I am talking um, to Michael Spiker, who is a writer and philosopher, and his focus is on aesthetics. I'm going to invite him in. Uh, let's see. Hey, Michael, how are you? Hello. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for chatting with us. I, you know, I, I wrote a, a bunch of questions for you, and, and we talked a little bit before uh, before we went live. Um, but I guess my first question to you is, um, you, you know, your, your focus is mainly on aesthetics, right? Um, philosophy as it applies to aesthetics. How does philosophy apply to uh, to art? It's a good question. Um... I'm, I'm inclined to believe that prior to modern art, it applied less than it does now. <laughs> um, meaning um, when I teach courses on modern and contemporary art, I often use a lot of philosophy uh, uh, books or articles um, along with some uh, art history books uh, because I think the question of modern art is a philosophical question because ev at every turn, the question was asked, what is art or what could be art? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think the main, that's one of the main ways um, philosophy applies to art. But I also think that artists themselves ask philosophical questions as well through their artwork. Um, some are broad philosophical questions that don't have anything to do with the art per se, like uh, questions about ethics and things like that. But but uh, so I think art is a great medium for asking philosophical questions and philosophy is a great medium for asking about the nature of art. So, so sort of this reciprocal relationship, I would say. That makes sense. And so do you think, so, you know, I, I often feel that, you know, the art really is the concept or the message and the, you know, and, and, and then the, the, the tangible a uh, piece of that art is just a representation of the of the message, right? Uh, and, and I think that goes goes hand in hand with what you just said about uh, you know about what philosophy or, or how philosophy applies to art. But you know the conversation of what art is, and I think this is an excellent question for a philosopher. Like, <laughs> like, what do you think art is? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I put you in the spot. <laughs> well, <laughs> philosophers have been trying to, to uh, define art since Plato, like thousands of years ago. So I don't know that we're ever going to have a full consensus on it. But um, uh, in fact, if, if, rather than trying to, to define art, a lot of philosophers have actually abandoned that question altogether for more of um, a question about that they might they might want to call it a theory of art rather than a definition of art. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, th I think the idea is that it has to be flexible. Uh, so, you know, 300 years ago, no one would have ever conceived the idea of digital art the way we can do it now. Um, or, or even, or in music, you know, like, do you mean they would have considered it something else rather than the arts? No, I just mean they wouldn't have even had the idea, like it didn't exist. Right, so so, right. so the definition of art has to allow for future things that we don't currently know about. And that's what makes it really difficult to define it. Uh, like we could define art today, all the things that are currently made, our art maybe could be defined, I mean, that would be, that would be hard enough, but there could be something that happens in 10 years that we could have never predicted that people are calling art. So that's what makes it right. really difficult to have like a solid definition. Right. I mean, that makes sense. And, and, and I, I guess that goes with, you know, also for what an artist is, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and, and the artist, like some of the more contemporary views of art talk about, uh, you know, that the art, art is what the art world decides. And they use a very, very broad understanding of the art world. Basically anyone, like some people, like someone that may decide I'd never want to see art. And they never go to a museum or a gallery. They never look at art. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously we could say they watch movies probably or listen to some music at some point. Right. But, but uh, you know, as far as like what we what we consider what we often consider the fine arts or whatever, um, they may not they may completely not participate in that. But basically, anyone that does participate in that is according to these definitions of the art world. But even that seems a little bit strange that the the art world is the um, this very, very broad group of people that gets to decide what is art and who is an artist. 
Um, and, and I'm just not sure um, any of those strict definitions are too helpful. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that's, that's a great question in and of itself, right? Who, like, who gets to decide what art is and who gets to decide who an artist is? And I think it's so broad and it's so <laughs> nuanced, right? Nuanced. Um, well, I mean, you take like, uh, well, and art has changed so rapidly. I remember uh, for, for a class I taught, um, I showed uh, two medieval paintings that were about 900 years apart and they're very similar. The, mm -hmm. the, the styles, you know, some of the colors are different. A little bit of the composition is different. And then I showed two paintings of of women, not in the not in the not in the same kind of setting, but uh, that were about thirty years apart in modern art and were extraordinarily different. Like they didn't look anything at all, like, uh, at all alike. And they're only thirty years apart. And these two medieval paintings that were nine hundred years apart are a lot more similar. Well, I think I think. Uh... I think the, the focus before photography was on depicting reality through mm -hmm. art. Right? Yes. Uh, and after the, the invention of photography, then people, I mean, perhaps artists felt more, um, you know, there was more fluidity to, uh, to just experiment with shapes uh, rather yeah. than trying to depict reality. <laughs> Uh, which, uh, yeah. And the, uh, and the invention of the paint tubes. I mean, it's such a silly thing that we take for granted now, but so that allowed, that paint. enabled the impressionist to go outside for the first time and paint on location. And so they had Absolutely. to do it quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, yeah, I, I, and, and this brings us back to like the original question. What, you know, how do you define art? Define art? And it's, it, you know, as you pointed out, <laughs> is something that is continuously evolving. Uh, so who knows how we'll, you know, attempt to define art in 50 years from now. Um, so, you know, creating art, uh, you know, I, I believe that, um, that art, uh, you know, needs to have emotion in order, in order to engage, um, you know, the viewer, right? Um, like how important is it to you? For emotion, yeah. Um, I mean, emotion connects us to all sorts of things. Um, there's a Harvard pro business professor named Gerald Zaltman who who says that 95 percent of our retail purchases are made on the basis of uh, you know subconscious emotions. How how an object made us feel more than any function that this object may have. Um, and I think, so I think emotions are a very powerful thing that draw, like that draws us to all sorts of things, not just art. So that's why I'm, I'm not sure it, it, it's enough for it to only be, or be the main thing with art, but it's certainly a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that a, a very important aspect of art is an aesthetic component. Um, I, I'm not one to say that aesthetics is the only thing of art, but uh, I do think it's a uh, it's a it's a core thing. And ev even even um, works of art that are trying to be anti-aesthetic still mm -hmm. depend on the fact that aesthetic aesthetics regularly re occur in artworks in order for to even to even have the idea of it being an anti-aesthetic. Um, so I guess um, what I'm saying is I uh, uh, you know the emotions aesthetics, meaning, all of these things have to work together, I think, um, and at different levels. Like some, some artists may focus a lot more on the emotional, the raw emotion. Other artists might focus more on uh, some kind of a, a expression or, or, or a communication or, or, or message or something. Um, other artists might focus more on the aesthetic aspect. And, um, and the great thing is, we can respect what we know about the artist, but we could still use their artwork to uh, attain or, or realize some, you know, our own personal feelings and meanings from it as well, which is, which is sort of the nice thing about it, um, that we're not limited by what the artist thought. You know, I guess, I guess my question is uh, backtracking a little bit, like, like, how do you define aesthetics as it applies to art? But you know, just, you know going back to a, to, a, to a basic point here, I think aesthetics has to do. Um, you know, obviously, one of the core aesthetic properties throughout history is is beauty, of course. Um, 
but it's also uh, people have listed all kinds of things, including the ugly, um, mm -hmm. but dainty, graceful, elegant, all of these, all of these uh, properties work as aesthetic properties, but aesthetics is sort of the, how the object appears to the senses. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, uh, and that's why it's it is really important for artists to consider. Cause even if the artist thinks the main goal of their work is to convey or express something, if the work isn't visually or, or if it's music, if it's not uh, auditory, if it's not appealing in those ways, um, people care a little bit less about what it might mean than, right. than if, than if it's something that draws them in, because the first thing you see as you know, if, if you take a painting, the first thing you see is just how it looks. And we've all been to galleries and you sort of glance over at a painting and, and it, uh, it doesn't do anything for you. So you just walk by it. But maybe it's maybe it's awesome, and <laughs> maybe the meaning behind it is amazing. But if you don't sort of have a reason to pursue that, uh, you know, then um, you might be you you might be missing out, but you but you won't know you're missing out because you you just you've already walked on by. Right. So it needs it needs to have it needs to have some sort of appeal, some sort of aesthetic appeal that you know calls on your senses. And uh, it could even be something that's that's like uh, repels you in a sense. Like the same way that right. you, you know, like you see something that's sh almost shocking um, and, uh, and you, you, but you, but you kind of, you kind of drawn to it. Um, it I, like think of, <laughs> I think of the paintings of, um, I think his name is Hyman Bloom, uh -huh. uh, who painted these um, cadavers and cow carcasses, but they're amazing paintings. Right. Um, and I was fortunate uh, to see some up here at the MFA in Boston a few years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, we, we talked about emotion uh, and, the, you know, the sort of raw emotion and how, uh, how it needs to be portrayed, um, you know, it needs to have some uh, aesthetic appeal in order to, to, you know, catch people's attention. So how much of, how much of logic does it go into creating, uh, and I'm not even know if this question makes sense, uh, you know, how much, how much logic or how, like how much of logic um, we can, um, we can attribute to a, an appealing work of art. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, I think it really depends. And, uh, I think this is, I mean, I think we keep circling back to the same idea that there's a lot of gray area when we're come to making and creating, you know, uh, and appreciating art, but, uh, you know, you could take an artist like Saul LeWitt who, who, who a lot of the works he made, he didn't actually make the final product. He, he mm -hmm. sent plans to, to a space and, and they hired people to actually implement the plans. Right. Um, so, you, so that, that, that almost feels like straight up logic <laughs> um, sure. in some ways, but I don't think that means you can't have an emotional reaction to his work. Mm -hmm. um, and the minimalists were, were, you know, rebelling against the, um, the abstract expressionists because they felt like they were just bleeding emotion all over the canvas. And so they, they Max sort of reason. reacted, they sort of re reacted against that and said, Nope, uh, here's my, um, canvas or this metal object on the floor. And what you see is what you get. And that's it. Nothing else to it. Do you like it or not? Right. Uh, you know, but even that, uh, you know, people have said they see, um, you know, uh, they see a lot of, they can still experience a kind of um, emotion, even if it's a more, um, I don't know if this makes sense or if this is sort of contradictory, but like a stoic um, uh, reaction, uh, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a kind of, you know, a kind of emotional reaction, maybe just sure. in, um, so, yeah, I think, I think um, the great thing between them is you know, the same way that some, like some artists might, really carefully lay out what they want to do on a painting before even putting a single brush stroke. Another artist might just start brushing all over the place. Okay. And, and, uh, um, uh, and so I think it really just depends on the, the, the person. And I think that's, I think to me, that's the great thing about art is it doesn't require just one way of looking at it or one way of making it. It, it yeah. allows for all sorts of personalities. Um, some, you know, some come easier to some people than others too. So, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's to me, it's a, it is the, the greatest thing about it or one. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess I, I want to, I want to know your thoughts on the, 
Uh, and the phrase that I've heard many artists say many times, my, my work speaks for itself. Um, like, what do you think about that? <laughs> does work speak for itself or does it need, or is, or is it a conduit to the message? I am, um, I am kind of of the opinion that if the work is good, it speaks for itself. And mm. I think sometimes it's not as good as it needed to be in order to speak for itself. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of not being able to get anything at all from a work of art without reading the description on, on mm. the museum. Uh, I, the descriptions are fine. Like they, they can sometimes help, you know, you pinpoint something and sometimes the title helps. Uh, like you take the famous painting, The Fall of Icarus and uh, by um, uh, Bruegel. Uh, and uh, without the title, you would probably never notice, at least at least not on a glance. You might notice yeah, that yeah. after a while of staring, but there are two small legs sticking out of the ocean <laughs> below. Um, so the title really is important to that painting to, you know, to, to really get the, to, to get, to give it the right kind of attention. To know that you're looking for the for something yeah i think i guess i guess i i partially agree with you with you know with your original statement i think like for me um you know the the aesthetic appeal of the work of art is necessary as an initial hook right uh, as a thing that's going to bring you over to the work as a thing that's going to you know uh, catch your interest uh initially and then i think the the deeper you dig uh into you know as you just pointed out beyond the the look of the work you know learning about the title of it who made it uh you know the context against the work was made and um and you know sort of the like the creative vision of the artist i think that's that's where i find uh the, the meaning of the work um you know i think like, to me personally something that has aesthetic appeal and doesn't, uh, and it stops at that. Uh, I mean, that's a speak for itself. I, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on the work. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's, it's okay for work to just be beautiful and that's it. Yeah. Um, but I understand, but I, I don't think most works are like that, but, uh, but I, I, to me, and then I guess the reason I say this is because if, we've all had the experience where we're not really sure what we think in our, uh, uh, like a given work means, right. but we could, but we might still like it because we, it's still got the, it's got really interesting color use or really interesting composition or, or just very skilled, um, hand made it. Um, but if, if you, if it's not attractive or, or doesn't, it doesn't have any kind of traction for you and, and you don't understand it, then you've got nothing. <laughs> so well, could, it, um, could it be, could it be, and again, I don't, I don't know if we'll, if we'll get to the answer of this. Could it be that aesthetic appeal alone can connect you to a work of art without going any further? I think so. Um, yeah. The same way that uh, we we look at a sunset, we don't think there's any hidden meaning behind it, That's true. Um, or a flower, or something. I mean, now, now those things could mean something in the right context or something, but uh, but so I think I think. Um, I think you could have aesthetic, uh, you know, an aesthetic experience of a work of art and not get beyond that. And I think that's mm -hmm. okay. And um, it's completely valid, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're almost at 20 minutes. I, I want to wrap up this with, um, if, um, like, what would be a piece of advice that you would give to an early career artist? As, as you know, the series are intended for early and mid career artists. Uh, but what like what would be a from from your you know from from your position, um, like what would be a piece of advice that you would give to an early career artist? I've seen a push for people to um, do the same kind of art over and over again and, and have a very consistent style. And I understand why that can be important because you want people to see your work and say, oh, that's this person. Mm -hmm. Rather than if you do 50 different styles, you do, you do a, an impressionist painting, an abstract expressionist painting, right, a minimalist right, right, painting, right. then nobody knows that's the same person. Um, 
so I understand the importance for coherence, but I would say experiment, even if it's not your public facing work, experiment all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, this is, you, you know, when you originally asked about the connection between philosophy and art, I think this is uh, a good a good connection between what it means to be a philosopher and what it means mm -hmm. to be an artist. Mm -hmm. A philosopher is, is, you know, not that philosophers are always the best at doing this or, you know, but, um, but a philosopher is supposed to always question their assumptions. Um, or not, maybe not always, but, but regularly, <laughs> um, uh, you have to obviously act. So you can't, um, you can't always just spend your time sitting back questioning your questioning everything all the time. You have to, you have to, you know, you, you have to do practical things and, and so on. But, but I think that would be the advice is to a, a young artist is don't stop questioning your work. Now I don't mean questioning its validity or it's good, but questioning what can mm -hmm. be done, yeah. try new things, um, experiment as much as possible and work outside your comfort zone. Yes, exactly. Right. Try new types of art too. Like if you're a painter, try, try dance or something. Just, yeah. you, know, it, it, you know, even if you, um, even if you never do anything further with it professionally or, or otherwise, uh, I think, um, I think people limit themselves too quickly because when it starts, especially, especially if you start having success, um, it's too easy to limit yourself. And I see this happen all the time with, with other, with very, with all, all kinds of professionals in different contexts where they, they got really good at something and then it's sort of their, you, you see their later stuff and it's still, it still is good because they got good at it, but it could have been awesome. Right. <laughs> Uh, because if they had allowed themselves to really stretch and push themselves rather than sort of doing the same things. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's sage advice, I think. Um, well, Michael, I really want to thank you for, for your insights. Uh, it's, this was a wonderful conversation. Like every conversation I have with you, I, I learn a ton. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and thank you to all of our viewers. If you like this type of content, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, there are more and more uh, videos like this one coming. Thank you. Thank you.